Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. You can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash I Know Dino. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. This week, our dinosaur of the day is Rapator. We have an interview with Dr. Eleanor Michelle from Friends of Crystal Palace Dinosaurs. And we have a bunch of news. But first, we want to give a shout out to our patrons on Patreon. Thank you so much for all your support. And for those of you listening, if you enjoy this podcast and want to help us keep this going, then please check out our page at patreon.com slash I know dino. Before we get into our news, we have an email from David it says, Hi, I was listening to your podcast on Allosaurus, and you mentioned that the dinosaur was called Antrodemus until the mid-1970s. I recently read the same in another source. If this is true, why did children's books about dinosaurs call the animal Allosaurus consistently? It's true for films as well, and he gives a couple of examples. Even if the continued use of Antrodemus was only in scholarly and scientific books and journals, it seems unlikely that popular culture would adapt Allosaurus as the standard when it was supposedly never called that until the 70s. I don't think this is reversed brontosaurus slash apatosaurus debate, is it? <laughs> Just curious and thought I would pass on these examples to you. So I did a whole bunch of digging on this, and it is pretty complicated. So it is true that it was called Antrodemus first, and that it was basically known as Antrodemus until the 1970s, but it's a little more complicated than that. There was a publication called Bulletin 110 from the United States National Museum, aka the Smithsonian, that gives a good summary of the Antrodemus Allosaurus naming issues. <laughs> but going back even further, first there was a dinosaur genus named Poecilopleuron Bucklandi, and it was discovered in France and named way back in 1838 and has its own whole complicated history with why it didn't end up being one of those first well-known dinosaurs. But basically, Leedy described part of a vertebra that he received second or third hand as a species of Poecilopleuron, giving it a species named Valens in 1870, but he hedged his bets and also called it Antrodemus in case more bones were found later distinguishing it enough from Poecilopleuron to warrant its own genus. So we start out with both Poecilopleuron valens and Antrodemus valens. Then seven years later, Marsh discovers a slightly more complete dinosaur. Rather than just one vertebra, he's got three vertebrae, a rib fragment, a tooth, a toe bone, and part of a humerus, and he names it Allosaurus fragilis. Two years after that, a man named F.F. F. Hubble, working for Cope, found a nearly complete Allosaurus, and it was crated up and shipped to Cope. But he appears to have never opened the crates or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why wouldn't you? He may not have known exactly what was in them because he was just bringing in so many fossils all the time. Or if he did look at them, he just never got around to preparing them. And it could be he realized that it was an Allosaurus and Marsh had already named it and so he wasn't interested in it or who knows. But... Later, Cope sold the fossils along with most of the rest of his collection to the American Museum of Natural History in 1895 after they sat around for about 20 years. <laughs> so paleontologists at the AMNH were amazed at the find, so they quickly prepared them and put them on display. And in 1908, they went up along with a few recreated bones to fill in the missing gaps in the skeleton. And in fact, this is the Allosaurus that's still on display at the AMNH, and it's the one that's shown kind of hunched over a sauropod's tail, like it's been eating it. Yum. Yep. And since it was the early days of paleontology in the early 1900s and late 1800s, Poecilopleuron, and as it would soon only be known, Antrodemus, were listed in many different groups over the next 40-something years by various authors. And since it was only known from a partial vertebra, everyday Americans had no real reason to take interest 
in Antrodemus, unlike the awesome Allosaurus that was mounted in the American Museum of Natural History. But then in 1920, Charles Whitney Gilmore was going through all the theropod dinosaurs in the National Museum's collection, trying to classify things better because it was kind of a mess. Like half of the things were megalosaurs and it was just all mixed up. So he compared the Allosaurus fragilis vertebra to the Antrodemus valens vertebra, which was the only bone around to be compared of the Antrodemus, and he found that they were virtually identical. So Gilmore followed the naming convention rules and determined that we should call both Antrodemus valens and Allosaurus fragilis was just no longer a necessary name because this one was named first. Because of the popularity of the American Museum of Natural History specimen and some other Allosaurus in popular culture, Gilmore thought this might be unpopular and even said in his paper, quote, the matter of retaining a name because it has become well fixed in the literature has no weight in nomenclature procedure so long as it can be shown that an already existing name has precedence, end quote. So, Mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> so he was very firm in his belief that Antrodemus was named before Allosaurus and therefore it's called Antrodemus. Although he did kind of leave a little wiggle room because he said, quote, were Allosaurus established on a good and sufficient specimen, there might be some reason in maintaining the genus as suggested, but since it also is based on meager materials that are hardly more diagnostic than the genotype of Antrodemus, it would seem, therefore, that the law of priority should prevail, end quote. So basically what he's saying is the original find by Marsh with those couple of vertebra, the partial leg bits and part of an arm isn't worth much more than just a single vertebra. So what's the point in renaming the whole thing? It just seems crazy. And it appears that the specimen that was on display at the American Museum of Natural History under the name Allosaurus was actually never really formally described in a paper. So it didn't really count in this whole nomenclature thing. <laughs> But then, jumping ahead over 50 years, in 1976, J.H. Madsen wrote Allosaurus fragilis, a revised osteology, and he formally described Allosaurus based on dozens of well-preserved, nearly complete specimens from the Cleveland Lloyd formation that we talked about before. And since then, people have been using Allosaurus fragilis in all of their papers instead of Antrodemus valens. And it seems to basically get to the point where we now have a very good record of Allosaurus specimens. So whether or not Antrodemus is the same as Allosaurus, I guess since we have such better remains of Allosaurus, we're just kind of ignoring Antrodemus. So it's kind of weird since Antrodemus was definitely named first and they appear to be the same thing. Not the first but, time that's happened, I don't think. Yeah. Usually what you see is they'll just take the better specimen and they'll make that the new type species, but it would still be a type species of Antrodemus. But they also said that since they don't know exactly where that Antrodemus came from, whereas they know exactly where this Allosaurus came from, and they know the age and they know the location, and they can kind of trace it back more scientifically than a guy got it from a guy who got it from another guy and then named it. I've got a guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, that name got precedence. So it is actually a lot like Brontosaurus in that Brontosaurus was named and then for a while it was considered not a name and now it's considered a name again, at least by some people. But in this case, it's kind of reversed. Allosaurus and Antrodemus were both considered a name for quite a while and then it was just Antrodemus until the 70s, but then... From then on, it's been basically considered Allosaurus. So basically because of Madsen. Yes, but there was a very popular Allosaurus that was technically called Allosaurus in the early 1900s. So there was something there kind of getting everybody on the Allosaurus bandwagon before Gilmore called the Allosaurus the same thing as Antrodemus. So. Yeah, that's true. They're both good names. Yeah, I like Allosaurus better, but that could just be because that's what we grew up with. I think it's kind of funny because Allosaurus is actually Latin for different, referring to its different vertebra. 
but it turns out that there was already a dinosaur named just from a vertebra that's the same as Allosaurus. Yeah. Yeah. Not a great name. Also kind of a weak name anyway. Different lizard. Yeah. Sounds cool. Yeah. Rolls off the tongue. It does. So now on to the news after that interesting history lesson. <laughs> it's kind of crazy how complicated dinosaur and even just names can get. Yeah, and I didn't even go into the whole story behind Poecilopleuron, which is even crazier. So we'll save that for another day. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So on the Isle of Wight in the UK, a family went on a fossil walk led by Dinosaur Isle staff, which, by the way, someday we'll get there. Sounds awesome. <laughs> anyway, this family found an iguanodon skull, according to Isle of Wight Radio, Emily, who found the fossil with her family, donated the skull to Dinosaur Isle, and now it's on display at the museum, so that's really cool. Yeah. Good family activity and very generous of them to donate. Yeah, that's cool. I would like an iguanodon skull, although I'll settle for a replica. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, next, an Asian auction house called Luxify is selling a T-Rex skull worth about $1.8 million, according to CNN. The skull was found by Theropoda Expeditions, which is a private fossil exploration firm in Montana, and they found it last summer. Luxify will also auction off a 45% complete T-Rex skeleton starting at $2.39 million and a 72% complete Triceratops skeleton for $790,000. So save up your pennies, Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to keep it, though. I'd want to give it to a museum or something. Yeah, I'm kind of hoping this ends up with museums because they're... They're saying that the T-Rex skeleton and the skull are in really good condition, good for research, so it would be nice if it ended up someplace where it could be studied. Yeah. Next, the poor Bayville dinosaur in New Jersey won't be getting repaired anytime soon, and we've talked about this dinosaur. It's a sauropod roadside attraction, and it's been around since the 1930s, and several cars have accidentally driven into it. Yeah, it's been decapitated a few times. <laughs> yeah, it's been through a lot. According to app.com, the dinosaur was sold to a local partnership, but the new owners haven't yet given permission to restore it. Currently, its head is in storage and its body is wrapped in plastic to help preserve it. And the group trying to restore it is called Save the Dinosaur, and they still need to raise $5,000 to fix it. So far, they've raised about $10,000, so I guess it kind of works out they don't have permission to fix it yet. The artist who will do the restoring is Shannon McDonald, a local who was dubbed, quote, the world's greatest Beatles artist by the Lord Mayor of Liverpool in 1998. And people can help fund this restoration by purchasing Save the Dinosaur t-shirts. Cool. I like a good t-shirt. Yeah. And I like a good roadside dinosaur attraction. <laughs> Next, thanks to Keegan, who shared this item with us via Facebook, Paleo Productions has a Kickstarter for museum-quality dinosaur skulls. The campaign goes until August 31st, and it's already raised nearly $5,000 for its $1,000 goal. For $75, you can get a 10-inch long Nanotyrannus skull replica or a 9-inch long Camarasaurus skull replica. And after the campaign ends, Paleo Productions plans to make more than 40 types of skulls with the plan to 3D print master skulls. That's really cool. It is. I've been both considering buying one of these and also considering trying to 3d print my own <laughs> yeah but that requires going to like a maker space and finding a 3d printable thing and everything yeah it's but, doable yeah i have to see how good these look does that mean we're getting one i don't know <laughs> <laughs> thanks to chris on twitter for sharing fossilfinder.org with us basically the team behind fossilfinder.org flew a drone over an area in northern Kenya known for early human ancestor fossils, and also there are some Cretaceous fossils there, potentially dinosaurs. And while they were flying the drone over the landscape, they were taking pictures basically of a one-foot square area over and over again, and then they're geotagged so that they know where the pictures were taken from. And they've uploaded all the pictures to fossilfinder.org, and their goal is to get 10 people to check each photo for a fossil or another artifact. So there aren't many dinosaurs, and they don't really actually expect to find any because they're so much less common than these human remains, or hominin, I guess. But 
like I said, there have been some Cretaceous fossils found there, and the process of finding any fossil is virtually identical. And we talked about that a little bit. You basically look at them in bright light, and hopefully you see a difference in color or texture or something that's just bone-shaped, and then you might have a fossil. So I went to the website, and I did their quick little tutorial where they show you how the process works, and you can look at some optional guidelines to help you determine if something's a real fossil. And then you can tag the photos, kind of like you're tagging people's faces in Facebook, or the way it used to work back when you had to actually highlight the person's face before it was like, oh, there's a face. Whose face is it? And you can tag it as either a fossil bone, a fossil shell, a root cast, a stone tool, or might be something, <laughs> if you're not so confident. It's a little bit tricky because... A piece of bark or tree can look a lot like a fossil. So they showed an example where they're like, this is a piece of tree in a picture, and this is a piece of fossil, but they look exactly the same. But then when they go out there physically, you've already identified the exact spot so they can find it more easily. I couldn't find exactly how many pictures they took, but the area is called the Turkana Basin, and it looks to be thousands of square miles so if they can get this technology really going and a lot of people are checking for fossils, it could be super useful because you could find really important fossils pretty easily with this method as long as you have enough people checking them. And since they have 10 people checking the individual pictures, they try to use that to kind of aggregate where a quote unquote hot spot is where there might be some really good fossils and then they'll go physically check and they seem to take a lot of videos, too, to show people what they found when they went to the areas. So it's pretty cool if you're interested in checking out what fossil exploration is like. This is a pretty similar way to do it. You lose a little bit of it in the pictures. If they could do like a 3D picture thing, it would be a lot more useful, but it's still cool. Version 2. Yeah. It's a cool idea, though. It is. I wanted to see a video where they showed how they actually took pictures of the area, but I couldn't find anything showing it. It's probably in there somewhere, and I just couldn't find it. Could be. Next, in Norway, somebody stole a leg from a Diplodocus fiberglass replica, which is part of a traveling dinosaur exhibit. The dinosaur is about 58 feet or 17 meters long, so the leg is pretty large. Yeah, I mean, we talked about the people stealing the fingers and stuff off a of Spinosaurus, which... <laughs> Seems reasonable compared to trying to steal a leg. I don't know what you would even do with the leg. Yeah. So the family that owns the exhibit's hoping to get the leg back, though according to the local, they don't have much hope in getting help to find it. The exhibit spokesman, Magnus Winter, said, quote, What we are wondering is if there is someone out there who woke up from a party with a dinosaur leg in their bed. It's okay to have a one-night stand, but we want our leg back. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> Yep, it would be nice if they returned it. Yes. They'd probably be afraid of ramifications, so it's probably gone. Could be. Or maybe the family got lucky and they read something in the paper about how it's okay, and we can hope, because apparently it's pretty expensive to fix. Oh, I'm sure. That's a large piece of fiberglass to remodel and attach. Yeah. In happier news, Pleasant Valley, Maryland might be getting a new park called Dinosaur Country, according to Carroll County Times. On August 30th, there will be a hearing to see if the land for the park, which is zoned for agricultural use, can be converted into a sculpture park with dinosaur replicas, a playground, and picnic tables. Christopher Spicer, who is considering buying the property to turn it into a park, said that he plans to build a visitor center and souvenir shop as well. But not everyone is happy about these plans, and some are protesting against it, saying that it would add too much traffic and noise to the area. So, it's the hearing that's taking place on August 30th. Good old NIMBYs. Not in my backyard. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be pretty cool. Yeah. I'd like to have that in my backyard. I would too. Of course, you'd have to have a much bigger backyard. <laughs> yeah, we could fit one. Like a, a small dinosaur. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> There's a new comic about a soccer player who battles a velociraptor, and it's coming out in November, according to Comics Alliance. B. Clay Moore, Clayton Henry, and Louis La Rosa are the creators. And if you're curious, here's the official description. Quote, 
15 years ago, the world's most famous soccer star and his former supermodel wife, pregnant with their unborn child, disappeared without a trace. The world believes they are dead, but in reality, their private jet crash-landed on a mysterious, unknown island ruled by prehistoric creatures from another time. This is the story of how they lost their humanity. This is savage. <laughs> That's pretty corny. It's an interesting concept. How do you even come up with that? I don't know. Lastly, according to Daily Call, two women won a table sculpting competition at the Miami County Fair for their dinosaur table. They had a three-tier serving stand that was held together by dinosaurs and lots of different kinds of dinosaurs of all different sizes. So it's interesting how dinosaurs can pop up in almost any situation. <laughs> That's true. And now we're going to jump into our interview with Dr. Eleanor Michelle. Dr. Eleanor Michelle has a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology, also in geosciences, from the University of Arizona, and is currently doing research at the Natural History Museum, London. Her primary expertise is in malacology, or the study of mollusks, but she focuses on evolution and ecology. It also occurred to me, I don't know if it's of interest, but I got interested in paleontology because I took um, my intro paleo course from Jack Sapkowski and David Raup at the University of Chicago when I was an undergraduate, and that sort of shifted me over into understanding that deep time has a lot to tell us about how evolution is, you know, where we find out how evolution has happened and tying the recent in with, with the deep past became pretty core to what I thought was the right way to go to study evolution. So you're not strictly a dinosaur person, but do you have a favorite dinosaur? Favorite dinosaurs are actually my Crystal Palace dinosaurs. And between them, my favorite sort of bounces around depending on which one I'm looking at most closely. <laughs> but the two iguanodons and the dynamic between them probably pull my affection most. They're the ones that I look at them and I see them as old friends. And then every time I see them, there's this little part of me where a little part of my heart jumps. And I think I've seen something new in their, in their sort of aging features. It's that wonderful. It, there's a love thing there, definitely. Yeah. So it's, it's the, the Iguanodon sculptures in Crystal Palace are the thing that at the moment are really uh, motivating me. It may sound a little strange that it's not a taxon per se. I mean, I think Iguanodons themselves are, are terrific. And I listened to your podcast about the Iguanodons and I, I think it's, it's a wonderful group. But then in the thing that really, really gets me going is these first representations of the, of them as potential living animals. Cool. So while we're on the topic, what other dinosaurs are in the park besides iguanodons? And I know they call them all Crystal Palace dinosaurs, but a lot of them aren't actually dinosaurs. Yeah. And in fact, we use the term the Crystal Palace dinosaurs to refer not only to the what was 31 sculptures of extinct animals. And then also there are geologic illustrations that there were a whole series of them around the whole area. Now we're left with fewer, but they're depictions of how geology works. So we use the term Crystal Palace dinosaurs, and I usually capitalize the D to indicate that it's a sort of a proper noun. And it refers to all the sculptures, now there are 29 of them left, and the geologic illustrations of those there are only four sculptures that are real dinosaurs. There are two iguanodons, the fabulous megalosaur, and the hyliosaur. And those are the original four Owen described. And then the rest of them are marine reptiles, the early amphibian-like animals, and extinct mammals. That's all. Cool. So... The Crystal Palace is kind of an interesting thing because originally the Crystal Palace was an actual sort of palace. It was a big steel and glass building built for the 1851 Great Exhibition in London. But then they made these dinosaurs a few years later. Do you know why they made these dinosaurs? Or was it just like an accent for the building? Yeah, well, so 1851, the world's first great exhibition was put up in Hyde Park in central London, down in the middle of town. And it was a bit of an experiment. And they got permission to put it in the center of the park, but they were only allowed to keep it there for six months. That was that was the deal. But it was such a smashing success that they decided to try to find a way to keep it going. And there was a lot of business wheelie dealy stuff going on <laughs> um, with the expansion into the suburbs. 
and the little uh, suburb area of Sydenham and Penge and Norwood was just at the point of being developed. And the guys who owned a lot of land up in Crystal Palace, I'm speaking from there right now, in this area, thought that what they could do is make a little deal about getting a bunch of train stations put into the area, bring in the Crystal Palace, and then suddenly develop it develop this region as a way to to increase their profits and and to grow London. So that's basically what happened. They moved the Crystal Palace from Hyde Park in its component pieces. And I think one of the things that was amazing about that building is that it was essentially the first large prefab building. So they took it down into its component parts, brought it down to South London, um, which is about seven kilometers away, something like that, put it onto a train rebuilt it in a very short period of time on the top of what's essentially the second highest point in this part of London, a terrific location with a view, and then made a giant park of 200 acres around it. And they filled the park with things to amuse people, to inform people, and to sort of draw in crowds. It was a sort of early, something like Epcot Center in the U.S., a sort of Disneyland that was with a focus, a little bit more focus on education. And inside the Crystal Palace, they put all kinds of wondrous things that they'd had originally, a lot of replica archaeological stuff, a lot of things about industry, and also some real material. And so you could pay to go into the Crystal Palace and see all these wonders. But they also wanted to have draws around the park. So if you go down the hill from where the giant palace was down it takes about 10 10 minutes to walk into one of the lower areas and this is in penge which is part of the crystal palace catchment area there's a, a sort of a hollow and in that area they remodeled the landscape to form the geologic tableau of the crystal palace dinosaurs awesome i didn't realize that it actually moved like that that's such a crazy thing to do <laughs> They did all kinds of crazy stuff. And I think the credit on a lot of that goes to um, Joseph Paxton, who was, he was originally a gardener, but he was, a, he was one of these kind of bonkers in a good way, uh, Victorian visionaries. And he saw, that's probably also why he saw the placement of the Crystal Palace really needed to have a really beautiful supporting gardens, garden and interesting garden around it. So, I mean, he had lots and lots of interests in addition to, he started out in gardening and then, and then expanded into doing this you know, architectural marvel of the Crystal Palace and built it in parts. They were manufactured far away from London and brought in on canal barges. The glass was made in Smethwick, for example, by a big glass manufacturer. And if you can think about how large sheets of glass are made, yeah. you can imagine that in 1854, 1850. Well, this would have been 1850. Making that glass would have been quite an extraordinary thing, shipping it to London, and then on the scale that they did it, because it was <laughs> essentially the largest building at the time. And that was all part of the vision of Joseph Paxton, who was originally a gardener. <laughs> and he made it so it could be taken down and put back together again. I should also say that the Hyde Park Crystal Palace was pretty impressive, but they decided to really big it up when they brought it down to South London. And they made it a third again as large. And um, they added a bunch of barrel vault arches. And so those are the kind of curvy arches with a fan top. And that that was a innovation at the time to put that as a part of the roof line. And now you see it all over the place. I have a little hobby when I travel around the world of looking for barrel vaulted arches and you'll see them everywhere. I saw them in South Carolina. In Brussels, the European Parliament building looks just like the Crystal Palace <laughs> if you stand in the right sort of angle, just all over the place. So that architectural innovation was was mirrored all over the place. Yeah, it's really an amazing building. I I remember seeing it for the first time or drawings of it at least because it's not there anymore and being amazed at how much glass they had, like you said, especially for the time putting together this intricate structure of steel and glass where there's basically no typical construction materials in the building at all is so amazing exactly and and then of course it would all be inside it would have all been open empty i think it, you know it's 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 a light box on the inside so it must have been extraordinary to be inside of it mm -hmm. really just just a, a an amazing building yeah 
So there's an organization called the Friends of Crystal Palace Dinosaurs. Are you in that organization? Yeah. In 2013, my friend and colleague Joe Kane and I were having a stroll around the park. Both of us are ha- happen to be expatriate Americans living in the UK and very fond of of history and the scientific history in particular of of Britain. And we went to look at the Crystal Palace dinosaurs and noted that they were crumbling quite visibly. You can't actually walk right up to them, but you can see them from a few tens of meters away. And you can see we could see cracks and, and what we ended up calling toes, teeth, and tails were falling off. And we thought, well, somebody should do something. And as soon as that phrase pops through your mind, you think, well, who's who's somebody? And, it, you know, obviously it should be the authorities in charge, whoever they might be, but they're not doing it. So um, we formed a friends organization then and there. And that's actually an official designation for a group of people who get together to provide a sort of positive, constructive pressure on the people in charge to get things done. So we are an official friends organization. We are now a charity, a registered charity. And our mission is to get conservation work done on the dinosaur sculptures and pull those toes, teeth, and tails back together. Um, And the more important structural uh, interior as well. And also improve the interpretation around the site and tell people why we feel really excited about, about the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. That's great. Yeah. The Friends Organization, we now have a small board of professional people who are working voluntarily to use their skills to make sure that conservation interpretation happens on the dinosaurs. And that includes some pretty hardcore stuff in the conservation area, very technical stuff. And then also lots of much more fun things around engagement and and just making the dinosaurs increasing love around the dinosaurs, making everybody realize that they are uh, celebrities and they need to be celebrated. They are one of the most amazing things in this part of uh, London. They are a grade one heritage monument, which is the highest designation that you can get in the UK. Mm-hmm. Things that have a similar heritage designation are like Stonehenge, <laughs> St. Paul's Cathedral, Buckingham Palace, basically all all the really very special monuments in the UK are are grade one. And that means that they are recognized as being very important for the history of the nation and internationally. It doesn't mean that anybody has to actually do all the work to conserve them. That actually has to come through pressure and people wanting to see it happen. And that's what we're trying to do now is build up the engagement and make everybody feel like these dinosaurs are their dinosaurs. Yeah, definitely. I saw a couple pictures about some of them being repaired. What kind of repairs have you guys gotten done so far? Yeah, well, we've we've succeeded at getting work done on one of them, and that's the famous standing iguanodon. And it now looks absolutely beautiful. There are 28 more sculptures to go, as far as conservation work goes, with varying degrees of decay on the sculptures. Some of them are in pretty bad shape, and some of them just need a little bit of, of maintenance and touching up. But the work on the standing iguanodon was the most urgent. Um, There were really large cracks in the body, potentially due to some shifting of the ground underneath it. Hmm. Uh, And they brought in a a conservation company that specialized in in historic structures and sculptures. And they worked on it for about six weeks, did a complete overall renovation of the structure, putting in pins, which are long long pieces of steel that bind it from side to side and also across the cracks. They covered over the cracks, re-sculpted the surface, repainted it, and basically replaced the teeth to make sure that they were all in good shape and really made it look very nice. That work, though, it doesn't come cheap because yeah. you need specialists to do it, so it costs quite a lot to get that done. And we're looking at a pretty steep pending bill on the next round of works to get all of them done We have had what's called a condition survey, which is an official survey of of each of the sculptures, but it's a little hard to actually nail down the costs exactly. It has ranged between about 600,000 pounds and maybe 800,000 pounds, but when you put on implementation costs, the overall works on the sculptures alone 
probably would be about a million pounds. And then we figure that to have a interpretation program that does justice to it would probably be about double that. So we're sort of looking at sort of two million pound overall project ideal. That's not going to happen very quickly, but we are making progress on getting these things worked on. The work on the standing of Guanadon finished in January. Now we've had a little bit of a pause and there's going to be a new round of works and that will be for about a half a dozen more of the sculptures and it'll start perhaps in the next couple of weeks. We're not exactly sure of the start date, but it'll it should happen sometime in early to mid August. Great. And then after that, we don't know exactly where the funding is coming from. We'll be working to get the council, which is the governing body that owns the land and the dinosaurs, we'll work to get them to try to put more funds in for it. They have done so already, including some funds. So it's come from Bromley Council and from the mayor's office in London. And we're hoping to get even more coming from them. But people might realize that things are a little bit in turmoil in Britain. So we don't really know exactly uh, how things are going to pan out. And we'll just keep our focus on trying to raise the funds needed to keep these heritage structures from falling down. Then we'll be turning to major funders that might be able to support us and hoping that we find friends of dinosaurs around the world that are interested in making sure these sculptures keep standing up. Yeah. Yeah, they come up a lot in news and just people when they talk about dinosaurs or dinosaur sculptures, Crystal Palace dinosaurs are often mentioned all around the world for sure. Yeah, you know, there's a funny thing. I think that the Crystal Palace dinosaurs are probably a little bit more famous internationally than they are locally. And that's one of the things that we want to try to change because they are they should be a source of absolutely enormous pride for everybody in the area. But I would say that within this area of London, they're seen as a sort of a quirky side thing. And we've done surveys to find out what people actually know about this part of their own heritage. And, you know, like any of these kind of surveys, you sometimes are a bit astounded to find that people who've lived on Crystal Palace Park next to the park think that the dinosaurs maybe date from the mid-1970s or something like that. <laughs> but in fact, they are from the mid-19th century. So they were built from 1852 to 1854. And it's time for them to become celebrated within all of the great things there are to see in London. But I have found when I travel in museums around the world that the Crystal Palace dinosaurs are sometimes more celebrated abroad than they are here. So, for example, in Brussels, there are panels about the Crystal Palace dinosaurs because of their connections with the iguanodons, but also as a founding outreach on paleontology. Apparently, they're in a museum, I believe, in Sydney. There's a comment about them. And you'll see references to them around the world where they are recognized as really important paleontological monuments. And they were the first ever reconstructions of extinct animals so that's the thing that makes them really really special yeah i just saw that looking at your website a couple minutes ago and i had no idea that they were the first ever extinct animal sculptures that's just crazy to me yeah at life size for the big ones i mean of course to make them first they were drawn and then they were modeled as small models and then they were modeled as a large model and then they were cast but they are the first ever attempt at doing this kind of a reconstruction and so that's the thing that makes them really important. Yeah, that's really cool. Do you know what they're made out of? We're really, really interested in that. So we have a, a sort of a multi-pronged program. And I'd say one of the main parts of our program is to look into the conservation areas. When I say conservation, I mean materials conservation, like material sciences. And we're interested in the history of how they were made, what the materials are, and then how that's weathered through the years and what we can do to keep it in good shape. So that's all the parts of the, of the conservation program. And we've got a terrific conservation team with a couple professional conservators leading that and a bunch of students and outreach going on. So it's it's really very active. Um, but we've been looking into to trying to find out from each of the sculptures what they were made of. We've got several different historians of concrete, or I should <laughs> correctly say historians of mortar, are looking at thin sections for us. We've got a, a historical paint analyst who's just at this very moment looking at very tiny little layers of paint and looking at the history of the color of the standing iguanodon. We have a, a chunk of it that I've now taken to her office. 
And so we're basically trying to reconstruct the material history of the sculptures themselves. And they are made of sort of a range of objects. As you can imagine, in, in the mid-1800s, the way that people made concrete is a little bit different than now. Mm -hmm. And also, the dinosaurs were made by an artist, a very talented artist named Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins. And he experimented with materials in a, in a bunch of different ways that might have been quite different from how someone who's constructing a house, for example, would do with mortars, concrete, and things like that. So when you look at, at the structures themselves, they are made of a range of things. The standing sculptures, the large ones, I should say, are essentially small buildings standing on pillars. So the standing iguanodon and the megalosaur, for example, are effectively small brick houses that are standing on brick pillars. And then they've had parts opened out so that when you actually put your head inside, they're hollow on the inside. You can see out of the mouth because that's open and there's daylight coming through. And then on the inside, it's very dark. But when your eyes adjust to this inside area, you can see bits of tiling on the inside. So they sort of smoothed it out slightly, brickwork. And when you do a cross section through the structure itself, you find that it's a combination of some brick in parts, some sort of gravel pulled together with mortar, and then an outer layer that would be rendered with another sort of concrete and then sculpted on the surface, partly cast, partly sculpted directly on the surface. And each one of those are, are different. <laughs> there are details picked out in each of these sculptures that sometimes are metal, and those have survived variously and are being replaced in various ways. So they're each of them made in slightly different ways. Wow. And that presents an amazing conservation challenge because you've got all these different materials put together in kind of wacky ways. How do you actually do the conservation work so that it, it all stays together? It's not as if it's made of one single kind of material. It's not like conserving, a let's say, a marble sculpture or even just a concrete sculpture. It's, it's this sort of amalgamation. And I should say that also when they made it, they did some supports on the inside with iron, hoop iron, and hoop iron in particular is a sort of flattened layers of iron. And that means that when it rusts, the rust sort of piles up in the little layers and expands to, mm -hmm. I get the number wrong, but something like five times its original thickness. And that might have worked really well when they first made it, but as time goes by and the sculptures weather, that hoop iron expanded and then just caused major cracks. So that was one source of decline of the sculptures over the years. Much of that has now been excavated and replaced with something else. Wow. Yeah, so it is it is a challenge to, to actually keep these sculptures pulled together. It's a very interesting and fun challenge. We have open days planned for the conservation stuff, and we did one last year when the iguanodon was being, the standing iguanodon Iggy was being worked on, and it was really, really fun. We had six different groups of people come onto the island and get to peer inside the belly and look at the teeth and climb around on the scaffolding and, and actually get up close and personal with the sculpture. It was a heck of a day because there was also a huge storm that came through. So we were doing this in incredibly high winds. People came anyway. We were, it, was a, it was a nonstop group of people. So it, was, it felt really like a major expedition, getting up close and personal to the big sculpture. Really, really fun. And we had our conservation team explaining things about how the mortars are put together, you know, how the metal is being used and what the challenges are for conservation versus preservation versus restoration, that whole group of sort of specialized terms for what you do with historic objects. Yeah, that is so much more complicated than I thought it would be. I was just imagining some like rebar and concrete and then you're done. <laughs> yeah, it's, a funny, it's like any job. It's a funny combination of that where some of it is really very simple and it's sort of jerry-rigged, you know, and some of it is very, very specialized work that requires very detailed stuff. Yeah. I think conservation stuff is just incredibly cool. It's, you know, bringing together the history and then these challenges of the materials is amazing. It's great. And I just have to stand back and wonder at the skills of the people who do it. Yeah, they've got my admiration. Yeah, just the topic of replacing that iron that's rusting inside the concrete seems impossible to me. That must be a very unique yeah. skill. <laughs> yeah, they're surgeons, surgeons of concrete sculptures. That's great. So is there 
in Iggy, is there usually a hole that you can stick your head up in or was that cut so that they could do the restoration work? I'm pretty sure that it's original because there's one in each of the big standing sculptures. Those are now gated. So if you were to be a naughty person and jump onto the island, you couldn't actually get in at the moment. We've got them locked up, but it used to be years and years ago, decades ago, that those holes were open. And so when you speak to local people in the area, they will often get a sort of a a wistful glazing over the eyes and they'll they'll say, you know, when I was a teenager, we'd get on to the island and we'd, you know, we'd get inside the dinosaurs. <laughs> um, and so that did happen. And, and it shows up actually in people's writing about the, about the dinosaurs as well. But now they are, they are definitely locked up and closed up. So you can't go in. Gotcha. Is that where the confusion, I was also reading on your website that they aren't sure there was that famous dinner party, whether it was actually inside the replica or if it was inside the mold. Is there enough space where you could actually fit a bunch of people inside that standing iguanodon? You can fit a few. You can probably fit a couple people. The inside is a, is a little bit like a deep sea submersible. It's about the size of a small car and you can kind of squeeze in maybe two people, three people, something like that. And once they've got the supports in there, it gets pretty impractical. So the dinner had an invitation list of important people listed of about 20 different people, I think. And so it's absolutely clear that they were not all sitting on the inside, no matter what, whether it was in the mold or whether it was actually inside the sculpture itself. What they could have done is put a trestle table with the couple most important people at the head, and that would be Richard Owen, maybe Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins as the artist, but he was also the one who was sort of coordinating this publicity stunt, and a few of the other important paleontologists and businessmen who made this all possible. So it's possible that there was a sort of a tea structure of a trestle table that seated a couple people inside the dinosaur, and then the rest of it sort of sticking out the back and going out the side somehow so that it vaguely looked as if they were all inside of it. <laughs> it. It was very well stage managed. It was a stroke of genius, I think, for them to, to do that PR event. Yeah, even now it just sounds like such a remarkable idea to go inside either a mold or the actual sculpture and have a dinner party with all these elaborate dishes and things before the opening. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is one of the things that has captured people's imaginations in the 160 years since then. And people mention it to us all the time. We are now working with a really terrific street theater and education company called Emerald Ant, who have made a life-size reconstruction of Iggy. And it is a convertible stage that has a lift-off lid and inside they have a, a small theater area and a table and they actually do a little theater piece that reconstructs the history of geology from about 1812 to 1860-ish in Britain. Um, they do a play that sort of shows all that and it's pitch perfect. It really does the job well because it's, it's historically very accurate but it is just screamingly funny sort of street theater stuff where, you know, lots of sort of crazy things happening. And uh, they had their launch in Lyme Regis in the Fossil Festival with um, audience of, you know, a couple hundred people at a time, lots of performances. And so we've got the Dinner in the Iguanodon is actually being launched right now, hoping to travel around the UK to schools, festivals, things like that, to actually bring the story of geology and uh, the paleontology and, and also the Crystal Palace dinosaurs just as a place, bring it around to everybody and, and make sure that it's all sort of part of their cherished history. That's awesome. You mentioned that there's an island that the dinosaurs are on. Could you explain what that is? I don't really know if I've seen what that means. Yeah, okay, well, maybe taking a little step back, Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins was the artist who designed all of the sculptures. So, you know, Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins has become my hero in the process of this. I didn't even know he existed before, you know, and I thought Richard Owen was the guy making all this happen. But Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins was the artist who brought these dinosaurs to life, and he was working in difficult circumstances in a couple different ways. One, quite obviously, he was working with very fragmentary evidence, 
And you look at the number of fossils of bones that he had to pull together to try to reconstruct the animal. And they were often very, very few. Richard Owen is credited as the anatomist who sort of pulled together the interpretation context for the dinosaurs. And he certainly did that. He was an absolutely brilliant anatomist. He and Georges Cuvier were the ones who paved the way for our understanding how animals fit together and how you would do a reconstruction. And so many of us have always thought that because Richard Owen was given the credit as the consulting scientist at the Crystal Palace Dinosaurs, that the whole reconstructions should be attributed to him. But in fact, when you look into the historical literature, when things were published, what Richard Owen actually wrote, it looks that the artist Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins was probably the person who formed our vision of dinosaurs much more immediately. Waterhouse Hawkins was an extraordinary illustrator. He was recognized as probably the best natural history illustrator of his time. When Darwin brought his specimens back from his round-the-world travels, they were pickled, horrible little things, and he brought them to Waterhouse Hawkins, and Hawkins redrew them as if they were living animals that seemed to almost jump off the page. So he was that kind of guy who could make something really come to life. Then he's working with the fossilists, the paleontologists of the time, and they present him with a few bones, scattered bones, maybe hip bones or a few teeth from the new finds of dinosaurs. And he put these together in the way that made most sense to him as a keen observer of animal form. And I think he did an incredibly good job. I mean, when you look at the Crystal Palace dinosaurs standing there, they look completely plausible. They look biomechanically possible. Mm -hmm. They actually, some of them are now known to be very, very inaccurate. I mean, they're, they're quadrupeds when they should be bipeds. But considering what he had to go with, he did a good job. Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins then went on, after building the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, to travel in the U.S. And he went on a lecture circuit and a consulting circuit. And he was hired in New York City to build a similar tableau in Central Park. And that process got pretty well underway. It was designed, and the sculptures were in the process of being built in the middle of a shed in Central Park. And then there was a conflict with a sort of a gangster boss, Tweed, and somehow this whole thing fell in the middle of it, and there was a big act of vandalism and boss tweeds guys came in and broke up all the sculptures and basically trashed the whole place and there wasn't any money to start it all over again and so that whole project basically died hmm. otherwise we would have had a parallel installation in new york city of american dinosaurs that were being found in the decades after crystal palace but since that sort of political conflict happened we don't have that and it took a while. There were no, no other dinosaur parks being put up for really quite some time. Nonetheless, you can see Waterhouse Hawkins had quite a bit of influence in the U.S., made designs for, a, for an exhibition hall in the Smithsonian. His paintings can be seen in Princeton, and he did a speaking tour around the U.S. So he was a, he was a well-known guy, and all of these sort of discovery processes had a very international component even in 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. And one of the things that he wanted to uh, ensure is that the whole landscape, not only the sculptures themselves, but the whole landscape told the story of geology. And, you know, as the I Know Dino audience knows that geology is, is a wonderful thing that tells us the story of deep time and the change of life through time. But that was all brand new in the mid 19th century. And in fact, it still is brand new to a lot of people. Um, so the message still needs to be told. But Waterhouse Hawkins took it as part of his core objective is to translate that kind of a, a complex story into something really entertaining and also something that you could kind of feel when you're walking around. So what he did is he set out it's actually three islands, effectively. It's a, a constructed landscape that is in the middle of a body of water, sort of two lakes at different levels with little tiny waterfalls in between them. Mm -hmm. And there are these three islands that each represent 
different geologic time periods. And he calls them the primary, secondary, and tertiary islands. And nowadays, we would correlate that with major geologic epochs and what we see as extinction boundaries in between them. But at the time, it was just known that these are time periods that have a lot of similarity between the fauna. Then there's a change. Then there's a, a bunch of different fauna and a bunch of different rocks and another change. So we have this sort of a layout that reflects what was known of the geology at the time. And the sculptures are put on their time appropriate locations. So when you walk through the Crystal Palace dinosaur site, you're walking through time. I recommend starting in the deep time end, which is at the far right. And then you get Labyrinthodon and Dicynodon, and then it, you move across an extinction boundary and find a lot of the other dinosaurs uh, and marine reptiles that were known and the teleosaurs. And then you move on to the big dinosaur island, which is the secondary island. And those are the ones that are usually shown in the pictures where we've got the three dinosaur groups, the Megalosaur, first dinosaur, real dinosaur named, Hyliosaur, which is the British forest dinosaur, and the iguanodons, also discovered in Britain. And then we learned a lot more about iguanodons from the big discoveries in Belgium that happened some time later. Then you go across another little isthmus and you go into the area where their extinct mammals are represented. And you've got a giant ground sloth, megatherium, and the Irish elk, the giant Irish elk, bringing us into basically the recent. And then you end up at the cafe, which is, of course, really today, because that's what you do for yourself. You know, that's that's our time. So it's it's really a fantastic walk through time. And it's something that people enjoy no matter how much of their brain they've got switched on. You can go completely blank and not wanting to have any history at all. And you just what you walk around and you see these goofy, crazy sculptures. And that's really fun. And if you're two years old, you end up screaming with delight at them and having a really, really lovely time. Looking at the birds as well, which are all, one of the great ironies is the birds are sitting on top of the dinosaur sculptures. <laughs> and so you see this kind of interaction, which now we see from a phylogenetic standpoint, an evolutionary standpoint, we see that as a, as a relationship. So you walk along and you can have that kind of entertainment value, but you can also go through the, the sort of layers of information. And not only are there the sculptures of the extinct animals, you've got interspersed in that, you've got the geologic illustrations. And some of those, some of the geologic illustrations are reconstructed to look like outcrops that you would find in other parts of England. So you'll find a, a limestone outcrop from the Jurassic, and they've brought in actual stones from hundreds of miles away from the quarries where these things are found, and then put them together to look like the actual outcrop. There is a real fossil tree sitting behind the megalosaur, almost invisible. It's just a crumbling Jurassic fossilized tree. But it's there, and it's been brought there. It's, it's the real thing. So they did as much to be genuine about it as possible. As a paleontologist, and my partner is also a paleontologist, we often have visits from our professional peers, and we take them for walks in Crystal Palace Park, and we find that we can talk about the dinosaurs from a professional standpoint, about the didactic inspiration from this site, and our peers are equally fascinated and captivated. They don't usually scream as much as a two-year-old does when they see the sculptures, but you know, there's this sort of there's this sort of amazing engagement. And it's astonishing. I mean, they are just sculptures, they're Victorian sculptures, but everybody loves them. They're just incredibly quirky and weird, but they have a lot to tell us about the history of science and how science happens, about what was known at the time and what we know now, and just sort of giving a an intuitive feeling for what those animals look like. Yeah, they are really cool looking and pretty unique. Yeah. So, for example, the iguanodons in Crystal Palace Park, there are two of them. One is standing and one is sprawling. The standing one looks like he's standing like a pachyderm. He's standing like a rhinoceros or an elephant with his feet straight under him and very sort of strongly quadrupedal. And then in front of him is another one that is sprawling like an actual iguana or a crocodile, sort of the legs are out to the side. And Waterhouse Hawkins would have been completely aware that those are contradictory <laughs> ways to 
reconstruct an animal. The musculature was either one or the other, but not both. What he was doing by putting two sculptures up there is he was presenting the controversy because basically the scientific community wasn't agreeing whether the iguanodons were standing like a rhinoceros or sprawling like a crocodile. And so Waterhouse Hawkins just thought, well, I'll do both of them and show people that there's a debate going on, show people that this is what's being thought about and give that actual aspect of the science life in the sculptures themselves. So I would say when I'm looking at the views of the dinosaurs, the ones I always the one I really appreciate the most is where you've got the sprawling iguanodon in front of the standing iguanodon and you've got those two things interacting because that's that to me is is such a powerful teaching tool. Yeah. Unfortunately for him it was neither. <laughs> It, not even close. I know neither one of those was even close to correct. Um, but I think what should be emphasized is what we think is correct is is a is a moving target, and that's yeah. one of the main reasons of why I think this site is so important for the history of science because it's really important for everybody to realize that science is always remodeling itself based on new ways of interpreting and new data. I yeah. should also comment about those two iguanodons. Not only is he showing the controversy there, and Richard Owen was in favor of one but not the other reconstruction, so <laughs> and he didn't seem to think it was a super idea to put them both there, but he kind of probably, as with many things, he probably just shrugged and went away and and he wrote the little guidebook, put his name on the front, and made it seem like he was responsible for the whole thing. But I think Waterhouse Hawkins was the one who really sort of pulled all these things together. So I think one of the things that's there that was inadvertent on the part of Waterhouse Hawkins, but kind of a necessity, is that Waterhouse Hawkins was presented with this single spike for the piles of iguanodon fossils. And if you've got a bilaterally symmetric organism, and you've got a single thing that's bilaterally symmetric, you put it right on the midline. So he put it on the end of the nose of the iguanodon, making it look a bit like a rhinoceros. And so there's sort of horn sitting on the end of the nose. Apparently, Richard Owen thought that wasn't really a very good idea. Again, he shrugged, walked away. But Waterhouse Hawkins put it on both of his reconstructions. So they've both got this little, very cute little horn on the front. When more iguanodon fossils were discovered in Belgium, a huge cache of them, and it was quickly realized that that spike actually came in two per individual animal. And probably the best place to put them was on the thumb. So we now know that that is a thumb spike and not a horn on the end of the nose. But here in Crystal Palace, we have a really big laugh about that because I started calling it the symbol of science because it shows how the mistakes can be made and then reinterpreted and then put together again. But because, because I have a little bit of a lisp, I said the thimble of science, and we all burst into hysterics on doing a program about this because there's the thimble of science sitting on the nose of the dinosaurs. <laughs> we now see this as this sort of golden thimble, and we've got that as a little bit of our logo. So we've got the thimble of science sitting on the nose of the iguanodon, and it makes us laugh every time we see it. So I know, all these wonderful, wonderful little little stories. But there, so the iguanodons are the focus for that kind of story. But we've got you know a similar story for many of of the sculptures. And I think there's a really interesting aspect is that as you go into deeper time, the oldest extinct animals are the Dicynodon and Labyrinthodon. And those are the most inaccurate reconstructions. I mean, they look very little like what we think a uh, labyrinthodon should look today. As you go more and more in towards the recent, there were more fossils, better reconstructions, and you get to the point where you look at the last in the series, the Ice Age mammals, and the reconstructions are really very good. And in 1854, the reconstruction is not all that different from what we have today to the point that the Irish elk is pretty much exactly spot on. We had loads of Irish elk fossils in this area, so they were very well known. We've got good analogies among all the servants today, so all the deer. And so there's not much of a change in the interpretation, and you had loads of data to go with 
on the stuff that's most recent. So you can see this whole process of how science actually works in deep time just by looking at that decreasing accuracy as you go into deep time. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, and the thing about walking through the site is you kind of feel these things in a way that you don't when you're reading it in a book. Yeah. So, yeah. Another point, one of the reasons this site often inspires people is that the sculptures themselves are not only odd, but also very beautiful in a just a wonderful way. And so they act as an inspiration to people for literature and also for graphic arts. And we have connected with a number of artists in the area who have painted or photographed or drawn the dinosaurs in many different ways. And we're trying to pull together an overview of the dinosaurs as muses. It's really interesting to see how these sculptures inspire people in very, very different ways. They are such incredible structures that really you, you can see people who have been inspired by them, I think, have found that their view of the world is changed in a good way. They're also, they have a celebrity past. They are featured in photographs with a number of sort of rock groups from the past. There's a part of a record sleeve from the group Cream taken on the dinosaurs. The punk group, the Slits, have a photo session from there. We've got pictures of a number of different celebrities. So yeah, the dinosaurs are celebrities and they're also inspirations and they are muses. Great. The Crystal Palace dinosaurs are firsts in a bunch of ways. First reconstructions of extinct animals. But the other thing that's actually really under-recognized is this is the first ever large-scale outreach, public outreach on science. If you're going to be very strictly speaking about it, there was public outreach on science by... Faraday, who showed the electric process elsewhere in London. It was, I think, a decade or two before the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. But in general, there's this moment of really quite a change in perspective that the general public would have an interest in complex ideas and in the beautiful ideas of science and would have an ability to actually absorb some of that. And that moment was in the mid-1850s. And the first time that that was really implemented was through the Crystal Palace dinosaurs as a major outreach on science. And that's true whether we're talking about natural history, where it certainly was the first natural history outreach, or in science in general. The idea of amazing the public and engaging them through visual means as well as sort of presenting the ideas, that was all radical and new. I tend to get a little hyperbolic here, and I'm going to make a claim that um, maybe some people will want to challenge me on, and that's great. But to my feeling, the idea of pulling in the general public when before that time, complex ideas were sort of held back as something that was only the, the domain of specialists. To me, that means that that was essentially the time of the birth of real democracy. Because you can talk about the ideals of democracy, which were happening in the late 18th century. But in order for democracy to work, people need to be able to absorb complex thoughts and have access to them. And that has to be a process of education and engagement. And when that actually started happening, that was when democracy was actually turning on its engines and really getting going. So to me, that is one of the most critical parts about the Crystal Palace site. So I, I see this as not only the birthplace of talking about geology, about paleontology, about extinction, deep time, natural history, and then when I sort of fly off the map, I'll say we can even pull in the whole democratic process into this sort of outreach package. And then you saw that happening all over in a bunch of other different ways of bringing the public into the rarefied area of thinking about things that was previously the domain only for scientists, for specialists. And I think it's for that reason that these grade one historic monuments should be preserved and celebrated for the celebrities that they really are. There's a pretty wide gap, it seems like, in terms of sculptures of dinosaurs. You've got the Crystal Palace ones from the 1850s, and I can't really think of any other dinosaur sculptures from the 1800s. So you kind of jump quite a few years before you see other ones that are portrayed in completely different 
stances and even their faces and features look totally different. Yeah. Um, and it does seem that the idea of a dinosaur theme park, it's something that pops up over and over again, but it didn't really happen until uh, it happened in the Crystal Palace and then had some other abortive attempts, which are really very interesting, and then didn't really happen again on a big scale until the end of the 19th century. And then there were a couple more that showed up. But I would say that the one in Crystal Palace was the one that was sort of at its core a uh, much more integrated and pure. Yeah. Switching gears from Crystal Palace dinosaurs, we talk a lot about new dinosaur names on the podcast, and there are a lot of rules that go along with taxonomic biological group naming systems. What kind of things are debated when you're talking about taxonomy and naming a new group? Well, the part of naming a new group is usually fairly uncontroversial in that if it's something completely new, then it just needs to be published properly according to the rules. And in the past, those rules meant that it had to be published on paper in a journal. And then in recent years, the ICZN and its parallel organizations have changed the rules so that it's possible to publish electronically. That debate went on for almost a decade and was very, very heated. But we now seem to have sorted that by the dual development of archiving tools for digital information and sort of a modernization of perspectives on how that can be accountable. But I would say one of the things that, that is probably the next hot thing to be debated is what is a type specimen? Because in the past, it was always some hard object that you put your hands on, and that usually meant had a three-dimensional uh, component. And I think that still exists. But the question of how do we fit that in with DNA data and information derived from sort of secondary sources like scanning, which is more relevant for paleontologists, that debate is sort of ongoing. And the same questions sort of rear their heads, usually every few months, strangely, in the professional discussion literature. So there's a lot going on. And I, the other thing I should mention, for six years, I ran the International Commission of Zoological Nomenclature as the exec sec for that organization. So I've got a really strong interest in names of animals and typification. So tying squishy concepts of taxa down to an archived standard, basically that's what a type specimen is and what museums are their core function really in my mind. When I was, I was listening to a few of your podcasts and I can't tell you how delighted I was to hear your enthusiasm and you know you guys just wade right in on that stuff and it seems as if your audience must be well versed in the importance of type specimens and all the process of actually getting the name right and you know making it work i just love that it was the first time i really heard that in a in a science broadcast because usually that's really swept under the rug so i just wanted to say how much i appreciate that thanks we do try although we do get a fair amount of things wrong too but we try to be accurate <laughs> Can I tell you, working on the inside of that for a long time, wrong can be a matter of interpretation. And even among the commission, the ICZN, the commissioners themselves, are all the absolute experts in names, nomenclature, nomenclature, whichever you want to call it. But they have differences of opinion on stuff, different ways of interpreting the rules of the code. And so the debates that we had to field on the inside were often quite fierce. And, um, you know, it, it, it was actually for a fairly legalistic and bibliographic kind of job. It was absolutely fascinating. And I really rather enjoyed it. It also has an important core mission. So I think it's an important thing to recognize. Great. So I think that's about all the questions I have. Is there anything else that you want to share? Yeah, I guess just working on this project with the Crystal Palace Dinosaurs has made me appreciate all the different ways that you communicate with people. And I wanted to thank the guys who put me in touch with you. Chris Colson runs a company called rent a dino and he's got a tyrannosaur that runs around and roars at people. And in some ways, it's the counter to what we're about at the Crystal Palace Dinosaurs because we're about the history and, and I'm strangely a little bit 
anti-North American dinosaurs. Oh, no. I am a North American originally. <laughs> um, but the reason for that is just because the, the British dinosaurs and the sort of foundation of paleontology in Britain gets a little bit overlooked. And anytime anyone says the word dinosaur, the predictable word on, on the public's lips is tyrannosaur or triceratops or something like that, you know. And it's like, well, wait a minute. What about our iguanodons? What about megalosaur? Hyliosaurs are beautiful. What an animal to have discovered right here in Britain. And so in some ways, having a walking, roaring tyrannosaur is slightly counter to what we're about in the Crystal Palace. But on the other hand, as soon as that happens, there's this emotional response when, he, when Chris brings his thing in, and this emotional response among people. And that's actually part of the learning moment. And that's what I'm having such a good time with in this Crystal Palace Dinosaur Project, is doing it in all these different ways. So you've got you know, a quote live tyrannosaur. We've got this uh, street theater engagement project, which is absolutely splendid and just fantastic. We're working with an artist who's doing wonderful, very cheerful and spare, but historically and anatomically very accurate sort of cartoon figures of the dinosaurs. I mean, basically the whole thing. We've done a play called The Dinosaur Doctors, the dinosaur doctors are the ones that come in and do the conservation work on the crumbling sculptures. Um, we've done a couple films. We're working with a great filmmaker and history tour specialist named Anthony Lewis. He's done a short film called The Lost Valley of London, four and a half minutes of absolutely pitch-perfect introduction to the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. It's also sort of hilarious camp style so it's wonderful to watch and then building on from that Anthony and our former conservation specialist Lisa Brierley put together the, the play of the dinosaur doctors and then they did another short film called the seven deadly agents of destruction and it's all about conservation risks to outdoor sculptures with the crystal palace dinosaurs as a focus and again it's done in this sort of camp hilarious animated style and bringing a what was an academic list of conservation threats into a format that you can use to teach kids of 10 years old and they'll actually find it really quite fun and start looking at historical stuff and saying hey look you know it's crumbling let's do something about it and getting the idea that there is this sort of shared responsibility for our heritage and that if you're going to keep your heritage you've got to actually do the work to make sure that it stays together yeah I guess that's probably it Garrett I think that's a shout out to some of the people we've been working with. Cool. All right. Well, that was a really good interview. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. I want to give another big thank you to Dr. Eleanor Michelle for talking with us about the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. Garrett was very dedicated. He was talking to her at 1 a.m. our time. Yep. <laughs> Until almost 3 a.m. You got to do what you got to do for dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to make my way to London one of these years not just you <laughs> that's true <laughs> but you've been to london that's true but i didn't see all the dinosaur things there did you see any of the dinosaur things i've seen the natural history museum oh that's a good one i saw dippy must be nice mm -hmm. dippy's gonna be gone by the time i get there that's true maybe we'll catch him in a traveling exhibit maybe they'll have like a little tiny plaque somewhere like dippy used to be here probably i, I doubt it it'll just be a blue whale <laughs> That's how you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Before we get into the dinosaur of the day, we have another word from our sponsor, Audible, who is offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day free trial. We have our book that goes into the naming convention surrounding Brontosaurus, which is written, read, and published by Sabrina, titled What Happened to Brontosaurus? So in case you didn't get enough of us talking about naming things from that long discussion of of Allosaurus, you can check out this book on Audible, and you can get it for free using our promo code. So to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash inodino. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash inodino for your free audiobook. Once you're there, you can search for our book, or you can check out another book from their massive selection. I have a set of Bluetooth headphones that I keep around my neck about 80% of the time now. <laughs> in public or in our house or when I'm sleeping so that I can listen to music, podcasts, or audiobooks. And audiobooks 
probably take up most of that time. They're really relaxing for sleeping, and they're nice if you have a really long activity. It makes it seem like it wasn't that long because you only got through like 10% of a book, even though you might have been doing chores for like two hours. Anyway, if you have any book that you'd like to read or listen to, there's a good chance that it's on Audible, so check out audibletrial.com slash inodino, and we'll get the credit for getting you a free book. Sounds good. And now for our dinosaur of the day, Rapator, which usually say what the name means, but it's in this case unclear what exactly the name means. It was named in 1932 by Frederick von Huhn, and he did not provide an etymology in his paper, and the word rapator doesn't exist in classical Latin and sometimes shows up in medieval Latin and means violator. It's possible that he was going for the Latin word raptor, which means to plunder, and thought that rapator meant plunderer or it was a misspelling of raptor also means thief. Yeah, I was kind of wondering the first time I saw this one, is it raptor spelled wrong? Because that's remarkably close. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised when I realized, oh, that is an actual dinosaur, not just this family. Yeah. So the type species is Raptor ornitholestoids, and the species name means ornitholestes-like, and it was named that because the raptor bone found was first considered to be similar to ornitholestes. It was a carnivorous theropod that lived in the early Cretaceous in what is now New South Wales, Australia, and the holotype is of a left hand bone found in 1905 on Lightning Ridge. The fossil is opalized. Cool. Mm -hmm. The bone is 2.75 inches or 7 centimeters long, and it's similar to a first finger of an alvarosaur or a primitive coelurosaurian. It's also similar to Australovenator, which was discovered in 2009, and based on that is thought to be a megaraptoran. It's estimated to be 30 feet or 9 meters long, again, based on being similar to Australovenator. And Australovenator and Rapator actually may be synonyms. According to Agnolan and colleagues, in 2010, they said that Rapator was a gnomum dubium due to only having fragments. But then another team, White and a team, found differences between the hand bones of Rapator and Australovenator. Also, Rapator and Australovenator were found in different formations that are about 10 million years apart, so it's possible they're from two different genera. Rapator may also be a synonym with Walgetosuchus, which is a theropod found in the same formation, but only a caudal vertebra of Walgetosuchus was found, so it's not clear if it was its own genus. But it's also opalized. That's all I care about. <laughs> yes. I really want to see an opalized fossil at some point. Yeah. So, Raptor is considered to be Megaraptoran, and Megaraptora is a group of large carnivorous theropods. It's controversial where they stand phylogenetically. Some scientists think that they're a branch of allosauroids, others think they were silurosaurs related to tyrannosaurids, and others think they're ave theropods. An unnamed dinosaur found in Lightning Ridge in September 2015, known as Lightning Claw, which may be synonymous with Rapator, shows that Megaraptorids probably evolved in Australia, then spread to Gondwana in evolutionary radiation. And evolutionary radiation is an increase in taxonomic diversity or morphological disparity due to adaptive change or the opening of ecospace. Yeah, it's, it can be like niche partitioning, where one dinosaur would evolve into a bunch of different types to fill different ecological gaps. But sometimes it just means that they're doing so well that by chance there's a whole bunch of different ones popping up. And our fun fact of the day comes from the International Commission of Zoological Nomenclature, which regulates the naming of plants and animals. So we've talked quite a bit about the principle of priority, although we've never phrased it by its appropriate name. And that states that the earliest name gets precedence. Like we've mentioned with things like Tyrannosaurus versus Manospondylus. It's a good thing that Tyrannosaurus was named first. But there are lots of other rules. For instance, in cases where the same author refers to an organism by multiple names, or when multiple people name the same organism at the same time, the principle of the first reviser applies. And basically, the first subsequent author who chooses and publishes a decision of which name should be followed gets to decide. Just hmm. as long as it gets accepted and published, you win. This is effectively how Antrodemus Valens was chosen over 
poikilopleuron valens. Of course, later Antrodemus was considered a nomen dubium because the only known fossil came from an unknown location and is of such poor quality compared to similar Allosaurus fossils, but that's how you end up with such complicated histories, is different rules and different or new information that pops up. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And if you would like to join our growing, steadily growing community of supporters, then please check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.